Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Najaz Ahmed and we'll discuss the largest scenario in West Asia, North Africa, or what is called the Middle East. Najaz, with Gaddafi's execution, and this really was an execution that was shown on television and various other uh, YouTube and other places, what do you think has changed? Or do you think it is really the scenario in Libya is at least not any different from what it was what you discussed last time after the fall of Tripoli? Well, uh, one thing is that I think one of, the, one of the major differences between the Bush regime and the Obama regime is that uh, the Bush regime used to uh, kidnap people and render them for torture. Obama regime assassinates. Uh, and this, this they have done now twice. Uh, they did that with Osama bin Laden and they did that with now with Gaddafi. Uh, he was alive. Um, he was killed on the spot. Uh, that's one thing that I want to say about that. The other is that uh, as we talked about last, uh, last time, inside there is not going to be a resistance of the Qaddafi loyalists and so on. But my view is that there's going to be a lot of chaos in the sense that the very people who came together with the objective of overthrowing uh, Qaddafi, uh, now they're, they're, there's going to be, I think, a brutal fight over his spoils um, in which various groups will, for, will form. Um, uh, the social cohesion that that dictatorship had provided in Libya among all the tribes and ethnic groups and regions and so on uh, is probably going to, to, to fall apart. I don't think the Americans basically care about that so long as they have the oil secure and a major military base for NATO. Because their interest in Libya is twofold. One is the oil, but the equally important is actually a major uh, air base for the rest of Africa. The fallout for the, of the, of this sort of completion, let us say, the, of the transition from the, the previous regime to now, I think is going to be largely in the neighborhood. I expect the whole of the Sahel uh, to be uh, in turmoil now. Uh, my sense is that uh, there's going to be an arc of instability, as the American phrase used to be about the Middle East, all the way, I think, from Algeria to Uganda uh, and southern Sudan. I think the scramble for the resources in Africa now is going to get speeded up enormously. So my sense is that the consequences of it for the rest of Africa, especially in the Sahel on the one side, the East Africa on the other side, and then in Algeria, I won't be surprised if that Islamist insurgency starts um, coming back. At what, at what scale, I don't know. It's interesting that you say that because there is also a lot of reports about now drone specific uh, cockpits being built in different places, Absolutely. what are called Absolutely. bases. Absolutely. And it really is for Somalia, yeah. Yeah. Ethiopia, yeah. Yeah. and this whole region. Absolutely. So Libya yeah. Yeah. could, in yeah. that sense, fit yeah. into the yeah. larger. Yeah. What, what we are seeing is the construction of an, of an empire of, of drone land. Drone uh, land. Yeah. That's an interesting yeah. phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now coming back to the West Asia scenario, which still remains the major political uh, battlefield. It seems interesting that the Americans and the Turks, Turkey seems to have, re, has seemed to have realigned themselves in terms of what you described earlier as Islamic, moderate Islam being backed by Americans. And in the sense that if you look at Syria, for instance, and what also is happening in Egypt, there seems to be some realignment taking place of Americans trying to co-opt a certain kind of Islamic forces into their uh, political agenda. I would say, first of all, that we are seeing a very interesting, historically unique, and for most people, I think, implausible um, uh, coalition, which consists of the Saudis and the Qataris on the one hand. The main NATO forces, that is to say, Western powers, 
uh, on the other, NATO Islamicists, that is the Erdogan regime in Turkey, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Israel. It's, it's, I mean, each one of them has their own very different interests. And, but they are coming together in a very formidable way. And one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, is common between the Syrian and the uh, Libyan situation, for example, is uh, the emergence of Qatar. Uh, Qatari army was used, Qatari uh, armed forces were used in, in Libya as part of the uh, uh, Arab League, NATO sort of uh, coalition. Um, the uh, the Ghaliyun, uh, the uh, major person being sponsored by the Americans, the EU uh, in Syria, is, uh, is being uh, bankrolled by Qatar. So uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, on the one, and we saw Saudi troops in Bahrain. So you you have a very very powerful combination here, um, and it's not fortuitous that uh, Turkey is playing a very very serious role in bringing the Muslim Brotherhood to power in country after country the role that Al Jazeera is playing because earlier it was seen as something which was different, which brought a lot of transparency into what was happening in West Asia. Now it seems to have become very close to what Al Arabiya war is. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, Prabir, I was very angry with Al Jazeera from the beginning because Al Jazeera Arabic, well before they launched their Al Jazeera English, I felt what played a very, very cynical role in uh, building up the uh, jihadi Islamism and so on. Uh, the hellfire that uh, Al Jazeera used to spit out in, on their Arabic channels in favor of all these people, the most fiery of the Brotherhood uh, preachers had hours and hours of preaching on Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera was the agency through which Osama bin Laden used to release its, uh, his um, uh, videos and so on and so forth. When they came, when they, they started this English channel, the idea was to put on it a liberal dissident face. That face continued to operate in the early part of what came to be called the Arab Spring, that is to say during the Tunisian Egyptian phase. But as soon as it came to, the uprisings came to the Yemen, to Bahrain, the Saudi domain proper, Saudi and Qatari domains proper, all the pretense uh, fell. And then came Libya and now Syria. It's as dirty as, uh, Fox News. It has become openly an instrument of Qatari uh, policy in that sense. Yeah, but, but, but interestingly, you know, Qatar itself is a part of this whole coalition. So yeah. um, Qatari policy means Saudi policy, it means NATO policy, it means all, all of that. Other, the other part of what seems to be happening, and this seems to be also a part of the American agenda, is to play also the various sectarian card or the confessional card which the French played, for instance, in Lebanon and in Syria earlier, which is to try and build up the Sunni identity, the Shia identity, and play one against the other. Do you see that also as a reason that Turkey, Turkey and Saudi Arabia is playing a certain kind of role and trying in that sense to build themselves up as a counterpoise to Iran? Well, um, uh, but let, me, let me make one more point about Al Jazeera and I'll um, reply to your question. Last week, by all counts, and really by all counts, um, there was a demonstration of a one million people in Damascus in favor of the Assad government. Not a word on Al Jazeera. And not a word in the international press either. No, but I mean international press, of course, but international press meaning Western press, and therefore international press, Indian press, uh, international press. But this grand Al Jazeera, the, that speaks for the Arab Spring and so on and so forth, Arab democracy and all that. A million strong, 
according to any number of sources, the, the Independent and so on. Uh, by the way, the Guardian has played a dreadful role uh, as well. But uh, coming back to sectarianism. This sectarianism has been a staple of Western policy. This is what the Americans did in Vietnam between the Buddhists and the Christians. This is what they did in uh, Laos between the Montagnards and the rest. This idea that, and you, this divide and rule, you know, the, I mean, the British are the ones who taught them all this. It was a subcontinent in the years of it, 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 it was the British who taught them uh, these things. So, so yes, uh, that is going on. Uh, and that has uh, immense ramifications. Um, any religion-based regime in the larger Middle East, as it is called, West Asia and North Africa, would be necessarily a sectarian regime. Um, in Syria, over 20% of the population is not Sunni Muslim. Uh, um, you know, I, I mean, if you include the Kurds, uh, who are Sunni, but uh, <clears throat> they're, they're not, not like Arab Kurds, and so on. Um, you're talking about 25% or so. And there are Christians, there are Druze, there are Alevis, there are a whole range of minorities. And the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, it, uh, Islam, is a, is a majoritarianism. And a bit more brutal than RSS. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's not something that you can say moderate Islam. It's a very brutal form of uh, majoritarianism. Uh, <clears throat> you just saw what happened in, in, in Egypt. Um, um, if the Muslim Brotherhood really comes to power alongside this, these armed forces, cops will be put in their place. Less so in Egypt. In Syria, there will be a bloodbath. That in, in fact, one of the issues is if there is a sectarian divide which is accentuated by particularly the opposition that is currently in coming into, the, or it's been backed by the West, it's not only Syria, it's also Lebanon. And one of the chief conduits um, for um, supply of arms in Syria is uh, the, uh, the Hariri group uh, in Lebanon, uh, paid for by the Saudis and so on. Yes, uh, it's going to be sectarian. Uh, it, and, and again, it is a long-standing imperial policy, but so is the Saudi Wahhabi policy, which is, they have not imported it from anywhere else. So it's fairly homegrown as well. And that is why I believe that a secular modernizing regime anywhere in in this whole part of the world, has to have a very strong um, position on separation of religion and politics, uh, whatever it takes to, to do it. The other appears to be forgotten <coughs> regime in, the, in West Asia, in the midst of all the others, is Yemen. Yes. Nothing has changed in Yemen. It's being backed, Saleh is being backed still by Saudi Arabia and of course the United States behind Saudi Arabia. Slaughters have taken place of people protesting Saleh's regime. It doesn't seem that there is any, any change that's, that's taking place there. Yemen is, is, uh, is, is presented as some sort of a tribal outpost out there somewhere. Yemen is the only part of the Arab world which had a communist revolution. In, the, in its southern part, and it had a republican revolution in its northern part. It is, it is the defeat in that re republican revolution that brought Saudi Arabia into Yemen as the dominant power. The great struggle between Nasserist secular uh, sort of uh, republicanism, authoritarian republicanism, and this Wahhabi Islam took place in, in, in Yemen. So Yemen has actually had a past of highly sophisticated political developments. Part of this Saleh and so part of the, uh, the, the point of convergence between Saleh, Saudi Arabia and Americans and so on is to suppress all of that past 
And it is the brutality in suppressing all of that past that about half a dozen different kinds of opposition to the regime have arisen, uh, including the regional ones. Um, the, 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 the South was united. The North and South were united only around the 1990s at some point. And there's a very strong movement in the South to undo that uh, unity. Um, that great, great struggle is never reported on. Instead, you get this uh, Al Qaeda in, uh, uh, you know, Ablaki and so on and so forth. <laughs> you know? So the story is never told. One of the dreadful things that has happened is that in this discussion of of jihadism and moderate Islam and so on and so forth, the actual political forces on the ground never get discussed. It's, it's a very different kind of. Uh, place than people imagine when they, they, they keep talking about this Al Qaeda and so forth. <laughs> so the distinction with Yemen as a historical, really, yeah. uh, with the historical past which goes back. Absolutely. So many they were the, of years. You know, when, when they talk, when they talk about you know the great seafaring past of the Arabs, the most prominent of them were the Yemenis. Yes. You know. <laughs> and to confuse it that with the. Desert Arab kingdoms of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> right, this is right. really these are coastal people. They, they, these were trading coastal people uh, who, who went uh, trading all over the place. So in that sense, the Arab Spring, the promise of Arab Spring has been at least partially defeated by the kind of large, regrouping, large, regrouping that has large, taken place. Large. And accept that the fact yeah. that movements did emerge is Look, something... The, the, the spring has been used to create the largest bridgehead that imperialism could have received on the African continent. That's in Libya. In Libya. Um, yes, the Mubarak regime is gone, but there's the military dictatorship. Um, the real power of the U.S.-Israeli combined in Egypt has always been uh, its alliance with the armed forces. Um, they are in power. Um, their record so far is very discouraging. So, in, in fact, I think there has been largely a defeat. Well, on that note, we'll finish this, this part of the discussion. We'll come back to the second part of the discussion where we discuss what is happening in Syria. Thank you.